This episode of the Cold Popshire podcast was brought to you by our Patreon. If you want to tell us which films we should watch, listen to up to two extra exclusive podcasts a month, or give us something to discuss in our new post credit scenes at the end of each episode, then please consider joining the cult and donating at www.patreon.com slash coldpopshire. Welcome everybody to the Cold Popshire podcast. Uh, my name is AJ, and I'm joined in studio. And by studio, I mean my filthy, filthy bedroom with Rowan. Hey, Rowan. Good day, AJ. With filthy, filthy Rowan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happy post-pandemic hangout. This is the first time we've seen each other in a couple of months. Happy socials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Richard over in Auckland by himself in his bedroom studio. Yep. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of podcasts are recorded alone. <laughs> You're normally alone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, so, um, yeah, this is the Cold Popture Podcast, and today, in, in sort of, I want to say in honour of, but it's more in reference to uh, the ex- what felt like extremely unlikely news of Zack Snyder's Justice League uh, getting the go-ahead, um, we thought it would be fun to do a podcast where we talk about the Snyder Cut as well as other forms of lost media. That was initially the plan. However, <laughs> um, lost media turns out is like an official classification of media and not just a term you can be like, yeah, this is lost media, sure. Um, so, sorry, I'm just readjusting my microphone. Um, so lost media specifically refers, refers to, to season one to six of the 2004 TV show starring Matthew Fox. Starring Matthew Fox, yeah. Um, no, according to the the lost media wiki, and that is not Lostpedia, Richard, that's just... Oh, <laughs> I did all my research on that. <laughs> right. I, 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 all now. my, everything I brought was just about the hurly bird. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, even on the Lost Media Wiki, there seems to be debate as to what officially counts as lost media but from what i can see lost media is uh, refers to fully made films or media whatever that existed but now no known trace of it exists so for example there are 97 early episodes of doctor who which are lost um, mm. because they were old and the, the studio just taped over them and the only way they've been able to recover some of these lost episodes is by people from people who taped them themselves on their mm. tv mm. yeah um the 1929 film the broadway melody which was the second film to ever win best picture is partially lost as it was shot in technicolor but now only a black and white version exists wow. uh, which is significant because it was technicolor before wizard of oz um so that's that's a ten, fun one. Ten years before ten years before mm. uh the fall of a nation which was the first ever film sequel to a birth of a nation not the first ever sequel to a birth of a nation which it was specifically which <laughs> it was that as well uh but that film is lost uh maybe for the best yeah. because from what i understand those films are pretty racist <laughs> um <laughs> That you're gonna say racy, <laughs> pretty <laughs> racist. So while while it would be cool to do an entire podcast on just lost media, we did want to expand our you know research a bit, mainly because I don't think any of us have actually. Yeah, we want to talk about stuff from the last literally 10 years, lost eh? media. I don't think any of us have actually seen any lost movies, have we? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're expanding our definition a bit to look at lost, partially lost, unavailable, unmade, or cancelled midway through production media so movies or whatever which had intriguing early versions we never got to see halted development midway through were kept from the public or in the case of the snyder cut sounded like they didn't even exist really until <laughs> um well it doesn't so, actually technically exist yet that's true yeah so what is the snyder cut i hear you asking and this might be a legitimate question i'm sure we have plenty of listeners who could not be bothered keeping up with this very tedious <laughs> hollywood story over the last couple of years <laughs> or however long it's been going on so um envisioned originally as part of a multi-movie story arc some sources say it was two films some say it's supposed to be a trilogy uh 2017's justice league was it supposed was to officially conclude- announced by dc when they did their the upcoming slate of the dceu mm. um it was justice league part one and two uh part one in 2017 part two in 2019 
Right, there you go. Oh. Um, so the the movies were supposed to conclude the main DC Universe storyline, which was started in Man of Steel, the Superman film, in 2013, and Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice in 2016. And writing these down, it just reminded me how fucking tone-deaf the titling scheme was for this <laughs> series. Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. What are you doing? Anyway, sorry. I'll, maybe we can get to that later. Um, both Man of Steel and Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice were directed by Zack Snyder, uh, and neither of which were really received all that positively <laughs> by critics. Um <laughs> Following a family tragedy in May of 2017, Snyder stepped down from director of Justice League and was replaced with Joss Whedon, who, if you don't know, directed Avengers 1 and 2, if that's relevant, among other things. Um, And he completed the film as an uncredited director. So if you watch Justice League now, technically, it still says directed by Zack Snyder at the start of it. Yeah, because who would want to put their name on the completed film? Well, when (laughs) when it says, like, it says, like, when Joss Whedon's credit for whatever it is comes up and appears on the same screen as a hobo sitting on the side of the road holding a cardboard sign that says i tried on it <laughs> like, is just whedon trying to tell us something um so whedon oversaw reshoots and other changes that added a brighter tone and more humor and cut the runtime down to 120 minutes in accordance with a mandate from warner bros uh, the theatrical justice league was a commercial failure and received Mixed to negative reviews. Um, That's leading, very generous. <laughs> <laughs> leading Warner Bros. to reevaluate the future of the DCEU. So it's very bad. Um, I didn't like the film. Did you guys like the film? I did not like the film. <laughs> yeah, I, I did not like the film either. I did not like the film either. I didn't like Batman v Superman, but Justice oh, League made... Made. <laughs> I'm not. I'm just saying my opinion. I think, I think it's like you're trying to be better than like. No. I didn't like Batman. No, 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 no. I, I thought the DCEU was going downhill before anyone else. I will say I didn't like Man of Steel when I first saw it, and I feel like everyone was a lot more warmer to that film. Um, mm. So, and that way, I I am. Oh, I don't like The Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> so, um, I didn't like Batman v Superman, but Justice League made Batman v Superman appear as this intelligent, brooding, kind of <laughs> philosophical yeah. movie. Because um, also, um, Batman v Superman uh, got a director's cut as well, which everyone, like, Snyder fanboys anyway, say, like, drastically improves the film. I bet it doesn't. I bet it, it, it doesn't. It, it improves the film. Oh, but drastically? But, like, it still has all the same sort of overall problems. But Rowan, yeah. were, you a, were you a DC fanboy at one stage? I have a vague memory. Okay. Of it's 2016. You come up to Auckland <laughs> where me and Richard are flatting at the time, um, and we have as a joke a Batman v Superman poster <laughs> on the wall <laughs> along next to our Space Jam and Speed Two Cruise Control and Fifty Shades of Grey posters. Uh, and you were like, "Why have you got Batman v Superman up there?" And we're like, "Oh, we kind of like collecting cool posters for bad movies." And you were like, "That's not a bad movie." Mm. And I remember we all didn't say anything. <laughs> very to very the next awkward. Yeah, um, conversational topic. No, yeah, I liked. Um, Man of Steel, mm-hmm. uh, and then I, uh, f- when I first saw Batman vs Superman, there was lots I didn't like about it, and then, kind of as I sat with it, I just didn't mind it. I didn't dislike mm. it. Like it's it's very pointedly one vision of how to do that franchise. That's and I think that's the nicest thing you could say about the DC <laughs> EU yeah. is that compared to Marvel, the f- their individual films do feel like they have more directorial Mm. direction flavor than a lot of the marvel films which almost in a lot of ways feel like they're directed by the same person the the thing i'll say for batman vs superman is it's like it's comically trying to be a gritty grown-up version of the superhero genre to the point where it just gets absolutely ridiculous Mm. um but like to what you said about justice league is it at least makes batman vs superman you can see that batman vs superman is at least a coherent singular Whole, and it's got and ideas. It, it, it works as a film. It's about whereas, like what would happen if God became a superhero. Like yeah, I yeah, like you, that. You That's could cool. describe Batman v Superman to someone, and they'd say that sounds cool. Yeah, mm. yeah. <laughs> you can say you don't like the film, but to say it's like a poorly made film mm. or like a failure of a of a vision. No, it's is, not a failure of a vision. Yeah, it's, the, the it's, theatrical it's, cut is very messy in terms of plot, though. Yeah, I, um, I like. I, would, I don't know if Tommy Wiseau's The Room is a failure of a vision either. <laughs> <laughs> but you can still look at the room and go oh it's like in inco- it's like incoherent, incoherent yeah. and it's, it's not well made, made 
whereas <laughs> uh, Batman vs Superman is well made in term, in a, as a, on a craft level, and then Justice League is a hodgepodge yes. of a fix-up job. Yeah. Um, so this led to the rise of the Release the Snyder Cut movement. Uh, which was a hashtag, among other things. I'm sure there's a website, SnyderCut.com or something (laughs) like that. Um, So the Snyder Cut referred to the abstract idea, because there wasn't literally a cut that just wasn't released, um, Mm. of Zack Snyder's original vision, an unimpeded Justice League, which didn't get bogged down with unnecessary humour or a reduced runtime. Uh, Some believed this version existed as simply an unreleased film, as opposed to the more likely scenario of it being a bunch of uncut footage and unfinished CGI. There are some great videos. Folding Ideas has a great video on, which he released last year, on why the Snyder Cut doesn't exist. So interested to see his (laughs) follow-up. Well, it's interesting because he is right like yeah because yeah. in the video he kind of says like there isn't a like a, a piece that they can ju- that they're just sitting on a shelf somewhere that they can just release it's like they mm. would need to sink tens of millions of dollars into this and i don't think they're going to do that and it's like <laughs> well th- that is what happened but yeah mm. yeah yeah mm. So the uh, release, the Snyder Cut movement seemed pretty grassroots and, f- and fan run until actors from the film like Ben Affleck and Gal Gadot and even Snyder himself began tweeting about it and posting about the Snyder Cut on social media. Um, and it was co- finally confirmed about a week or go, a week, a week or so ago, sorry, that Zack Snyder's Justice League will be financed around $30 million is their conservative estimate mm. um, and released on HBO's upcoming streaming service, HBO Max. Now, can't wait. I it's very interesting. My God, mm. it's I'm so interested. Yeah. In, in in this, but nothing about Zack Snyder's previous movies in the DC universe make me think it'll be particularly good. Um, I think that Zack Snyder's not a very good storyteller. I think he can make some stuff look really cool. Visually. Yeah, he's a great visual artist. Mm. He'd be good with um music videos. Mm, yeah uh but there is no there, there's this weird kind of attitude with snyder fanboys that this is somehow like the this auteur's vision and it's like uh, look at this dude it is an auteur's vision what is he an auteur though <laughs> yeah he's he's like the definition of an auteur what do you think the definition of auteur is can someone fact check us on the definition an, an auteur, of auteur is please? like a, a master of a craft no it's just like a very singular um, no, i don't think so uh, rowan's right what? Hey, what does it mean? Uh, it, it's it's like to do. It's with, neither positive um, or negative. It's like the individual style, and they have complete creative control over all elements. So Michael okay. Michael Bay is an auteur. Rowan called him the last auteur in Hollywood um, <laughs> on our Transformers episode. But yeah. it's like yeah, when every every single facet of production is this director's vision. Yeah, like yeah. So auteur. yeah, Michael Bay's a kind of pure auteur because he just seems to get complete control, and no one, you know, any proves it every wow. time by making yeah. billions of dollars and it, no it one even questions like, them it seems like auteurs just aren't very good then yeah yeah well mm. like nolan tarantino wes anderson right these are right. all ones when, when it's like you know you could look at a prop from their films and know that it's their vision mm. oh, and they just have the position in their career to tell executives to go fuck themselves because they want to make yeah. exactly the movies they want to make oh and- an anti peter jackson <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, yeah. now I understand what auteur is now. Um, uh, yeah. So, regardless of that small detour, like he's no, I don't think he's a good director. I don't think he's a good storyteller. But the, the Snyder fanboys is, uh, seem to act like um, we missed out on some, like, on, like, the greatest superhero team-up movie ever in Justice mm. League because he, he had to leave and Joss Whedon took over. And I definitely think Joss Whedon... Uh, made the film worse. Oh, one hundred percent. All the all the Whedonisms in there are bad. But I don't know if I would prefer. We'll, we'll get into this later. But it's, I reckon there's a parallel here to what you always say about why the rise of Skywalker sucked, which is it, it's one th- It's you've got to at least continue the the direction. Mm. You can't backtrack. And Justice League is it's even worse than Rise of Skywalker in that sense because it's backtracking in the middle of production and trying to like undo Mm. a bunch of stuff that was in the can and and on and like already committed to in the course of one film and like you mentioned that it's got like a brighter tone it like literally has a brighter tone because they've taken footage that was meant to be contrasty and (laughs) shot in one direction and they've just cranked the saturation (laughs) and tried to make it the way Joss Whedon would have shot it um a mess and and so like the thing we're actually going to get is 
the original vision of what was committed when those films uh, those scenes were filmed not the half reshot mm. half re-edited you know it's it's no one's vision by the time you get to justice league the theatrical cut right mm. but i would not be surprised if Zack snyder's justice league Oh, it's yeah. worse. Than yeah, no, Justice no. Justice League 27. I don't I think, think it'll be, be I think worse. it'll be more coherent and I don't yeah, yeah I don't think it can be worse cuz oh. what we got wasn't even really a film. Yeah. It was just a yeah. it was just a mess. Um like it, we already knew post Batman vs Superman that like the Zack Snyder gamble that Warner Brothers had taken on this or to a filmmaker had failed. Like it wasn't they weren't going to get themselves to the Marvel tentpole position that they wanted but they were already like four films into production and they were like mil- hundreds of millions of dollars committed on Zack snyder so, it's so let's weird, at man. least see that gamble <laughs> you know played out to its end the film probably won't be good it's probably even worse again than batman vs superman because i don't know if you can recall but like right after batman vs superman came out and they were already halfway through production of justice league part one or whatever they were up to in justice league there were articles where they had people they had like invited the press onto set to like reassure them that no we're putting like jokes in and the tone is sort of shifting so like even within whatever the snyder cut ends up being it's still uh, a backtrack from what his original vision for those films would have been and then he got i reckon putting the tinfoil hat on he got fired like no his daughter i know yeah his daughter (laughs) His daughter died, but <laughs> Rowan won't even why say is... killed, killed herself because he thinks the studio did it. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, uh, that's obviously. I I think that's like a very separate and tragic thing. The fact that he's coming back to do his version of the film to me just says he was never okay with leaving the project. Right. Um. He has said it's it's uh, there's an element of closure. Yeah. Um. To it, which I can understand. I'm just saying, like, the fact they even chose Zack Snyder as the director to gamble their cinematic universe on was like, why would you pick Zack Snyder? He'd just done Sucker Punch, his worst film, and <laughs> like, now you're, you're like, yeah, this is the guy that we'll that we'll pin everything on. I don't know. Yeah. I think, but he'd done Watchmen, which was like a fanboy favorite, and a mm. and a and a taking seri- mm-hmm. superheroes grittily and adultly serious, and then. Yeah, his first film out of the bat was Superman, which shouldn't really get the adult gritty treatment. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. weird. Weird choices <laughs> going back I, this far. I, I guess, like, a team of executives were looking at what Marvel was doing, which was, like, skewing very family-friendly, and it was already owned by Disney at that point. They were like, right, what's out in on the superhero craze that isn't just a direct copy of mm. Marvel? And so that's why they were happy to greenlight All good ideas. Zack Snyder doing <laughs> this very filmy kind of... You know, yeah, let's take superheroes seriously, which... All good ideas. Yeah. It's just Superman is a is a weird one to start with that philosophy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so apparently the Snyder Cut uh, will be, which is officially being just called Zack Snyder's Justice League. Much um, classier name than yeah. the Snyder classier, Cut. Yeah. <laughs> um, apparently it will be f- around, it could be four hours long. Or six um, Which just long. sounds like you don't know. Yeah, so yeah, like, like, know let's address that film. point, right? Because I, I think... I think it's clear that the the Snyder cut that people were globbing onto is comes from this idea that you see all the time on film Twitter where you get articles like, did you know the original cut of such and such was three and a half hours long? It's like, mm. and you know, and it, it, the same articles will always trot out the same point in response to those sort of factoids that the first cut of any movie is like yeah. four times longer yeah, than the, the theatrical the edition. Cut. That's yeah, the assembly cut, like the, the work prints of Justice League were, of course, going to be much longer. And the ones that Zack Snyder had completed were, quote unquote, the Snyder cut. But they also weren't finished films. Yeah, they yeah. were just versions of everything they'd shot. Yeah. So uh, so now we get this like fire up of now that the Zack Snyder's Justice League is going to be a thing. There's like a fan petition to release a four hour cut of Star Wars Episode 3. And it's like... That film doesn't exist, and to, <laughs> to, sure, four hours worth of footage might exist, but like y- you're dredging up, like you're just extending the ins and out points of every yeah. scene to make it longer. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's not actually more story. So uh, that's I think where the Justice League release the Snyder Cut thing came from, because of course there was going to be a longer, a, a more 
Zack Snyder official version, but <laughs> that's not that. That's why they need to pump thirty million dollars into it to actually finish the yeah, edit. Yeah. That'll be all for CGI or complete I the edit. I know. I think it's as simple as like you have to help hire an editorial staff and yeah. a post production crew to come on and do like several months worth of work, and yeah, a whole bunch of CGI probably to un mm. unfuck what uh, was done to the sort of yeah. movie. He but, shared. Zack Snyder tweeted a picture of Dark Side or Dark Seed. How do you Dark say Dark Side? Dark Side. Dark yeah. Side. Who is apparently in the Snyder Cut but wasn't in. 2017's Justice League. Yeah, there's the the whole bit where, oh, on Themyscira where, or um, Apocalypse or where, like there, there's a bit and you see the Green Lanterns, um, you know, mm. that part of the movie. Um, flashback. It's like yeah. a, the flashback right. with the mother boxes. Apparently Darkseid was supposed to be the villain then, um, but he was cut well, from the right. film. Darkseid is in yeah. the, ex- a, a brief flash of Darkseid is in the extended cut of Batman vs Superman. Right. So um, he, he was obviously being set up. Yeah, that, that's the scene they released afterwards, wasn't it? That they, like, a week after it was in cinemas, they released it online with, like... Mm. Or was that... They might I, just I, I no, I think you're thinking of the scene that was released online when the extended cut of Batman vs Superman was doing its, like, marketing program. Right, yeah, that, and that was Steppenwolf, wasn't it? Not Dark Souls. Oh, right. Yeah, well, I'm getting very... Sense. I don't know the Stephen stuff Wolf well was enough. the main villain in the Justice League theatrical cut. These movies are stupid. <laughs> um, yeah. But anyway, he released a promo picture that was like, it was like, it's happening or something like yeah. that. A picture yeah, of Darkseid. Yeah. It looked like shit. <laughs> the, picture, <laughs> the picture looks as bad as twenty. Yeah, because he released... He, sh- he showed that picture like a year ago in black uh, and white and that was kind uh, of his like teasing that like right, the right, Snyder right. Cut, cut does exist and because there's mm. all the stuff about like the black suit Superman that was like heavily teased mm. and like and actors have said um you know oh like uh the, we filled with a black suit and it you know it would never well, end Zach, up in the film Zack then- Snyder was tweeting images yeah. close-up images of the black suit before he was fired so it was obviously a part of the film yeah so and th- this brings us back around and we should probably move on from the Snyder Cut pretty soon but remember <laughs> the moustache gate and how yeah. Yeah. how Henry Cavill had a moustache and they did really bad CGI to, to remove it hmm. um we're we're diving back into that rabbit hole the, to, no, to be fair though be, moustache we, gate was a result of reshoots so if Zack Snyder's not using any of the reshoots of the reshoots yeah so none oh. of that None of that footage will probably be part of this oh, new film. Oh, shit. Yeah. Because it's... I mean, there, there will be... They're going to have to jump through some hoops to assemble a cut that he didn't finish shooting himself. So they, they throw away everything Joss Whedon did and they go back to everything he shot. They're still not going to have a complete movie yeah. in that material. Apparently, so actors, uh, the actors are going to do voice work for it. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, right, there's right. ADR, but no additional shooting. But um, yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure when Joss Whedon was hired... It was just um, just see it through post production, and then he saw the thing and was like, "I need to we reshoot to. a fuckload of this." And they ended up like, you know, there's quite a significant chunk of that film is uh, clearly reshoots, and you can tell because mm. of Henry Cavill's moustache or like yeah. and the and the jarring tonal shifts into comedy and yeah, like, and, 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 and it is painter. like night and day. And <laughs> worst, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah. literally night and day in a in a sense because it goes from like dark and gloomy to like overlit and yeah, completely yeah. different. And stuff worlds. that was clearly shot to be nighttime. They're like, yeah. oh, now it's daytime. <laughs> like the whole yeah. climax of the film that was in the trailers, <laughs> and then in the film, it's like the lighting is all different. It looks so stupid. Yeah. Yeah, um, we'll move on from the the Snyder Cup, but I just want to shout out to my least favorite moment of 2017's Justice League, which is when Superman returns and says something to Batman about Batman hating him, and Batman goes, "I don't not like you" or something like that, and it yeah. was like I don't want to see Batman do with like an insecure fucking office the office style joke <laughs> like right yeah, now well, like the thing i was like and when when justice league came out and i'm surprised i didn't see more people talking about this i think people have in, in the day since then but like clearly there's a different resurrection of superman um mm. like yeah that's, that's I, no one talks go. about this huh yeah, but so at the end of Batman v Superman, the Superman dies, and the last thing you see in the film is his coffin and bits dust particles rising off it, which was your indication as an audience member that Superman was coming back. And then he comes back in a completely yeah, different way. Yeah, it's like they, they, get, they get to the film, and it's like, yep, he's completely dead. All we have to do is touch this box and the water, and then we put him in the water. And <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's so Very convoluted. Strange. But like, presumably there was some kind of... Um, rebirth with like Kryptonian hypersleep, which is what happened in the comics, which is um, mm. for all intents and purposes is identical to death um, <laughs> for humans. <laughs> um, and then he was like going to come back, but be evil. And that's where the black suit comes in. And yeah. Mm. Um, and, and like Michael Shannon shot on justice league to do something for like a version of general Zod. That's yeah. 
No. Obviously, never made it to the. Film. I, he mentioned we were I just want to um, something as well. He was like, "Yeah, well, yeah, I did a couple. Like I did a day of stuff. shooting for Justice League. I had to wear these fucking flippers." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and everyone's um, like, "What?" <laughs> I I want to remark on the irony of how this has already happened before, almost completely within the DC like lineup of films. Can either of you guys? Do you either of you know where I'm going with this? No. The, um, I'm so, the so Richard cool. Donner, yeah, Superman two cut. Oh, right. So. Richard Donner shot Superman 1 and Superman 2 back to back, same sort of thing, and then was fired by the studio halfway through completing Superman 2, mm, and then yeah. years later got to come back and read it Superman 2, and so there's now two versions of Superman 2, and mm. the Richard Donner cut is, I, don't, I reckon, better, but it's got that same thing of you can tell where the editorial has had to kind of stitch together two different visions to make up. The, the stuff that he wasn't That's able just to shoot. The DC style, baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's flavor, yeah. That's their trademark. Uh, right. but, but it is really fun when you then get two different versions of the same movie at a Hollywood tentpole budget. It like, is. It is yeah, fun. I'm looking forward to Justice League just for that reason of like, mm. yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I'm, I'm not going to rewatch Justice League, but I'm excited to watch it. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to rewatch it for comparison. I'll just do, watch the stuff. Do cut. you guys want a four hour cut or a mini series? What's uh, the difference? I would rather watch it as a miniseries. I, I don't have the attention span to sit there for it. <laughs> Good yeah. point. Uh, it'll be a miniseries, right? Because it's coming on a streaming service. And- yeah. If it is that long, I've, I think it'll end up being like two hours, 58 minutes or something. Shit. Right, Richard, Do you, shall we move on from the Snyder Cut? I'm desperate to. I'll yep. tell you what. Mm-hmm. Um, Richard, what have you prepared for our very uh, kind of loose definition of Lost Media podcast? Um, okay. That do you want a, a big one or a lot? Do you want the good news or the bad news? <laughs> um, oh, you no. choose, dude. Whatever oh, you think will be wait, the best. Wait, is there a lost media that we are going to also refer? A very meta lost media that we're going to talk about? We'll talk about <laughs> it too much. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a clip of that lost media could be. Inserted. It's also not lost. Richard has. Yeah. A, oh I, no, I but it's, it's to lost it. to the ears of the patrons. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Well, let, let's talk about a similarly lost media then. <laughs> um, with um, one of the most famous pieces of quote unquote lost media. Um, <laughs> Is the day the clown cried? The mm-hmm. Jerry, have you guys heard of this? Yeah, I vaguely. heard about it ten minutes ago when AJ told me. <laughs> nice. Um, so <laughs> it's uh, a, a Holocaust film starring uh, Jerry Lewis, famous uh, the Nutty Professor himself, Jerry Lewis. Um, and so it's about a, a circus clown who gets imprisoned in a, imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp. So it's the original Jojo Rabbit, but um, <laughs> except like not really at all, but. So the, this film, essentially, it's completed. They, they finished filming, and then they just went, fuck, this is so bad. <laughs> We're never releasing this. And so there's been... Um, and the, the, actually, the entire plot is, like, available online. Because there are, like, very... F- there's few people that have claimed to have seen the entire film. Um, Harry Shearer from The Simpsons is one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So he said he saw a rough cut in 1979, which is when the film was supposed to come out. Um, And he said about the day the clown cried, with most of these kind of things, you find that the anticipation or the concept is better than the thing itself. But seeing this film was really awe-inspiring and that you are are really in the presence of presence of a perfect object this was a perfect object this movie is so drastically wrong its pathos and comedy are so wildly misplaced that you could not in your fantasy of what it might be like improve on what it really is oh my god that's all you can say wow Mm. so it's real actually is real fucking bad yeah yeah and so um it, like it, it, when when this was in production, it was like very controversial because it, it's the same kind of thing actually we, that we saw, but much worse with um Taika saying, "Oh, I'm doing a Nazi comedy," and people go, "Fuck, Taika, the the Thor Ragnarok guy is he can't mm. do serious. He's and he's going to tackle Nazis." Um, and Jerry Lewis, this was um his kind of his first big uh, dramatic role was the King of Comedy, um, which came out in 1982. So it was before that, and um. You know, it was like, fuck, he, he's never done anything serious in his entire life. Um, and even this doesn't sound like it's particularly serious if it's a circus clown going to a concentration well, okay. camp. Do you want to know the plot? Yes. Okay. So Lewis plays a washed up German circus clown called Helmut Dork. 
um, during World War Two, and then so he used to be famous, and then he's kind of down on his down on his luck a little bit, and he's in a bar one night, and he gets drunk, and he kind of and he mocks Adolf Hitler, and so he gets um, interrogated by the Gestapo and put in a um, a concentration camp, and then he's there for like four years. So he tries to like brag to everyone around him that he's like actually this famous performer and um they don't really believe him and he's kind of like an outcast in the concentration camp and then a bunch of kids end up coming in and um they go oh oh you're a clown you should you should perform for them and he does and then they don't really like it and so everyone beats him up and then while he's lying um and it's sulking about his predicament he sees um through uh, on the other side of the camp like through a fence um where the jewish pr- prisoners are held because they were kept um segregated and he sees a bunch of jewish children and he performs for them and um they they love him and so he gets mm. this new audience uh and so then eventually he's ordered to stop performing for them and then uh because it's strictly forbidden and then uh, you know, he's like, oh, the, I can't see the kids unhappy, so I have to keep performing for them. Uh, but then the SS come and put an end to that. And then he's put in solitary confinement for a bit. And then uh, the SS gets an idea. They go, Jewish kids love this clown. So oh um, he ends up having to like accompany the kids to Auschwitz. And so he ends up being like a Pied Piper used by the SS to lead um, the children into the like gas chambers. And so he, the movie ends um, with him, like, they're like, oh, come on, you know, like lead the children into the gas chamber. And he goes, no, like, I can't leave them. I have to go in with them so that their last moments are filled with joy. And the movie ends with him taking a young girl's hand and walking into the gas chamber. Why would you want to make that movie? That's such a, like, everything about that, as, you know, as someone who's written things before, <laughs> as we, we all are, like, I would get to that point and be like, I don't really like this. <laughs> I don't want to be responsible for this story. Yeah, well, he didn't, because... <laughs> um, <laughs> right, so so what, does there any more information about how it, like, did Jerry Lewis himself, like, throw yeah, so, it away? So Jerry Lewis directed it and stars in it. Um, he didn't right. actually write it, though, but... Um, it was, it was supposed to premiere at Cannes. Um, so, so it was actually 1972 that it was it was made, not not 79. Um, but yeah, he he took the rough cut and then essentially was just like, oh, "This is mine. I'm taking this. No one's ever allowed <laughs> to see this." Um, but uh, there was a a documentary that came out um, a few years ago that um, it was called Der Clown. And it was like yeah. a, a German documentary about it kind of thing. And it had about 30 minutes of the film in the documentary. And that wow. um, was uploaded online, like a 31 minute version on Vimeo of like footage of the day the clown cried. I remember seeing this and I like, I sort of scroll through and watch parts of it. Um, but that's now unavailable as well. Um, wow. And yeah, it was uh, before Jerry Lewis's death. Um, he gave a... Uh, the incomplete copy because apparently now the like fully finished cut of the film doesn't actually ex- exist but there's like a 75 minute um incomplete copy that has like pretty much the entire story in it that was donated to the library of congress which essentially exists to save media from being lost um uh, that was donated there and he said you can't um screen it before june 2024 um and then he died like a, a year or two later so we might see this one day. What's happening in June 2024? <laughs> I, it'll be something to do with like copyrights or whatever. Oh, um, right. But yeah, or just, just him estimating, I'll definitely be dead by then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, mm. But yeah, there's a um, there's a French critic who's, who's claimed to have seen it and said that he loved it. Um, there, really? Yeah, there, there's like a handful of reviews out there. Some people are like, this is uh you know an absurdist masterpiece and then some people are like, this is for a fucking bad um but uh, right up until his death death jerry lewis um was being asked about it and so are we ever going to get to see it and uh one quote he had was in terms of that film i was embarrassed i was ashamed of the work i was grateful that i had the power to contain it all and never let anyone see it it was bad <laughs> bad 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 he said but i'll tell you how it ends 
Wow. Hmm. I'll tell you how it ends. That's nice. And of course, if we ever see it, it won't be as bad as it, you know history has. Well, kind according of to Harry Shearer, it is. It. Yeah, well, I thought I you were going to say it yeah. won't be as bad as Justice League, and I was like, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just mean like it will be not. It might not be good, but like once mm. it's it's become like a mythically kind of bad yeah. thing. That yeah, hmm. it sounds it's kind of creepy. The whole concept sounds pretty it, sad. It, there's like a creepiness mm. to it because of its subject matter. Well, the, the, like um, what's it called? Uh, La Vita e Bella, Life is Beautiful, um, is mm. a pretty similar mm. movie, um, right? Uh, with mm. about like you know, it's it's it starts first half as a rom com. Have you guys seen it? No. Yeah, I have. Um, so like yeah, the first half is starring Roberto Benigni. The first half is like just a straight up rom com. It's very nice, and then um, him and his son get taken to a concentration camp, and the whole time he's joking around and trying to make it like. A fun thing for his son. Wow! But it's like it's very, it's a very tragic film, right? Um, okay, well, thank you, Richard. Um, let's now go from so we went from like a tentpole Hollywood blockbuster, you know, big genre, big big um big comic book film, into something a little bit more obscure. Now let's dive right back into that tentpole Hollywood blockbusters we never saw with Rowan, who. We haven't really talked about this as as this this trio, um, not not on a recorded medium anyway. Um, there is, of course, released a lot sooner than I think anyone thought was going to be <laughs> released. Um, there is details about the alternate Star Wars Episode Nine, and of course, when you say released, you mean leaked. Leaked. No one released it. <laughs> right. True. True. Um, with you know concept art and a script was was leaked uh revealing what colin trevorrow who was uh removed from the project as director uh before the last jedi came out just yeah, before, before the last jedi like came a out? couple of months before the last mm. jedi was released um so th- he his, his the version of the script he wrote which followed on from the last jedi um leaked and uh yeah we haven't really talked I, it seems like such cult pop fodder mm. that the three of us have not recorded we've recorded our thoughts on the on the rise of skywalker um but not really on what sounds like could have been a much better send off to the divisive sequel trilogy i'll just start by saying uh thank you for tasking me with uh re- going back in and doing some star wars stuff <laughs> the hardest one <laughs> so i've really i've really enjoyed not doing anything star wars for mm. the last few months as as we, people <laughs> won't know this but we have a group chat with the three of us and for a few months the name of the group chat was just fuck star wars and whenever we'd start talking about star wars for the first time in our uh, the three of our friendships we would all find ourselves agreeing oh and and just <laughs> stopping talking about it like we'd be talking about star wars for a bit and then we'd be, then rowan would be like actually you know what fuck star wars and we'd, we'd be like yeah <laughs> like Please see the name of the group chat. <laughs> <laughs> and what's our group chat called now, AJ? Uh, absolute Chaps. I forgot why. <laughs> uh, because <laughs> you said of... something was absolute chaos. And but you said oh, right. uh, auto-created to Chaps. <laughs> and because we're the three Chaps. <laughs> absolute Chaps. Absolute Chaps. Nice. Um, yeah, so, yeah, like really hot on the heels of The Rise of Skywalker being released to critical... Probably one of the worst panning. critical responses I've ever seen a major Hollywood film <laughs> in my life. Uh, sh- sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I, from what I could follow, sort of, uh, when I was following Star Wars news really closely, I think the sequence of events was uh, some, some like famous, you know, some Star Wars leakers, prolific Star Wars leakers, uh, released. A, a version of an episode nine and accredited it to Colin Trevorrow, which he then debunked on Twitter straight away saying, I don't know where you got that. That is not my movie. And it was like a horrible uh, mm. sort of synopsis for the film. And then about a fortnight later, the jewel of the fate script started appearing online. A bunch of concept art started appearing online stuff that you like when taken in aggregate, you go, Oh, this is, this is legit. This is a. Mm. This is real, and it you know it completely debunked um, the thing that had been accredited to Colin Trevorrow. So right. I, I you know tinfoil hat back on. I think he didn't want his name being slandered. I didn't think he wanted people thinking oh, the JJ Abrams thing was at least better than what he was gunning for. Um, so you reckon Trevorrow released? I reckon someone in the Trevorrow camp was like, uh, no, this is not. Because he was rather unceremoniously let go from the project. And that at the time, there were a lot of people being like, oh, thank God, he would have been horrible. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, so, how wrong we were. <laughs> I think that that um, I, had a, I had a conspiracy theory that the rise of Skywalker was actually a grassroots campaign to um, bring public favour back to Colin Trevorrow in time for Jurassic World Dominion. <laughs> <laughs> It's like an, an unprecedented move of studio cooperation. And for, for one losing completely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so you can you can just jump on Google right now and punch in Jewel of the Fates PDF and, hmm. you know, moments later just be reading a 133-page script yep. for a draft that seems fairly far along and um, if you don't want to do that uh, mr sunday movies had like produced an animated mm, summation mm. of the plot as well which is really good um here i am giving a shout out to a channel that has 10 10 times more followers than we do but um, there you it, go but if you're interested in what this version of the film would be i i would recommend reading the script because it's as close to you know it's it's written to be readable like mm. it's um you get sort of moments where you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, fuck yeah, this is great stuff. Like the, mm. you, the action sequences kind of play out. If you can get your head around reading scripts, which usually takes a couple of pages to kind of fall into that rhythm, yeah. um, you start getting a sense of what kind of movie this would have been. Um, and do you want me to just run through the Yeah, the plot? Can, can we do um, like, yeah. not you know, don't spend 20 minutes yeah, on yeah, it, yeah. but like So like uh, spoilers for a film that was never made. Um, <laughs> the Jewel of the Fates takes place a sort of, uh, they don't sort of ever clarify when it take how what the time gap between Rise of Skywalker and Jewel of the uh, between Last Jedi, Last Jedi and uh, Jewel of the Fates was, but it's it's clearly some time has passed. You know, characters are described as being um, like Ray in her initial description is described as not being the girl we last saw, but a grown woman, powerful mm-hmm. and strong. Like um, Hux has like grey in his hair, so like and the galaxy has moved on quite a bit. They're in like the grip of a sort of totalitarian lockdown. Um, Imagine mood. if it was like. 15 years later i think it's about 10 years later that's cr- that's it's a, cool. it's a pretty sizable jump wow. um and uh so the the whole thing sort of opens with a uh, a sort of heist gone wrong which results in our hero characters stealing a star destroyer mm-hmm. and there's uh you know it's very the sort of the setup initially is very reminiscent of the start of return of the jedi mm-hmm. um an interesting note is that like rose is the first recognizable character put on screen in the film mm. um and then ray Already has better a... than what she got in rise of skywalker <laughs> <laughs> oh, no rose's uh her opening thing is that she's described as like battle hardened and uh like uh, uh, adventure worn and battle ready Fuck or something yeah. so she's given and she's given a lot to do throughout the film um the characters steal a star destroyer and then a, a good chunk of the movie takes place on Coruscant, which is the planet that was sort of the backbone setting of the prequels. Yeah. Um, and the, the script actually has a lot of material that weaves into the into the prequels, into the rest of the saga, and also just makes callbacks to like The Force Awakens. And um, it, and it's a it's a very direct continuation of The Last Jedi mm. in in lots of ways. Like Ray is referred to both. Um, as it is, as she's like characters call her and refer to her as the last Jedi in a way that feels very sort of living up to the mm. promise of the last Jedi. Um, uh, so, so the main sort of middle chunk of the film involves uh, the resistance characters sneaking onto Coruscant so that they can hijack the Jedi temple and send a message out to all the systems. Cause the, the first order has locked down the galaxy and blocked all transmissions and, mm. and done a sort of blockade thing. Um, and so they send out like a beacon and we probably would have got a sort of sequence a lot like um, Lord of the Rings Return of the King where the signal fires burn and we go through different places. And you can sort of just tell that the plan there would have been like uh, cue John Williams, like yeah. do your thing, man, make the like, you know, give us a, a brand new piece of music that's just absolutely epic. Um, yeah. And then... Kylo Ren's whole thing is uh, going off to a, a temple and uh, exploring the world of Mortis, which is not something I'm super familiar with, but I know enough that it's uh, a pretty deep cut from the Clone Wars cartoon series. So oh, the the film actually makes a lot of deep cut Star Wars connections that would have made the sort of super fans 
uh, would have made them really happy, but it's the kind of stuff that you'd blink and you'd miss it if you were just a regular fan. Um, Which is ideal, right? It's, yeah, yeah, it's not the... Um, it, it, it's the yeah, There's a lot of fan service in the film, but it's not the kind of, like, punch you in the face, don't you remember the original trilogy stuff that mm. J.J. did for The Rise yeah, of Skywalker. Yeah. Um, the most on-the-nose piece of fan service, which... Um, I think would have been quite cool or could have been quite cool is um, Kylo Ren has a Empire Strikes Back style confrontation with a vision of Darth Vader where mm. you would have had a pretty cool sort of fun you know, that's, visual that's, iconography. To me, that's the iffiest part that I yeah. read, but I could see it being cool, but I could also see it being like, we got Darth Vader in the sequel <laughs> trilogy. Are you happy yeah, now, yeah. everybody? Uh, well, no, for me, the iffiest part is um, this film would have been the first time that Ray and Poe had shared scenes and they go very quickly for a romance subplot between them, mm. which, uh, you know, they're both fine actors. So I reckon they could have really pulled it off. It mm. just kind of feels a bit, I don't know. Um, but then, Poe and Finn it. are gay for each other. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. So it's like, again, they, they jettisoned any um, Finn Poe Boo. romance, um, which I guess just probably from the top down from Disney, they didn't want to do that or something. Um, but so so anyway, I re- I read this script again this morning in preparation for the thing, and the <laughs> the one thing I can say about that romance subplot is it does allow them to address the stuff that the prequel trilogy set up about how Jedi's aren't allowed to have attachments, and mm-hmm. it is their way of sort of um, incorporating that into the script and nice. letting Rey become her own Jedi and sort of abandon all the nice. the pretenses of that um, ancient religion. Um, the the film then sort of climaxes. For... So does Kylo Ren meets like a oh yes yeah. so no uh, so Kylo Ren kind of gets his Vadering storyline yeah. where he uh, he is, becomes dependent on the mask and he gets a new mask and he kind of becomes his his own Vader um, yeah. all while uh, going on this mission to discover more about the Sith he he temporarily gets a new master who teaches him to be kind of this um, force sucking vampire mm. who like kills people. But then very quickly he kills that master and becomes his own thing again. So there's even more of the like killing the, like Kylo Ren's attitude of killing the past. I feel like you don't need um, to do it twice, but all right. <laughs> it's yeah. I, don't, I, I kind of, that's a bit that's iffy for me. The whole, they introduce this thing of like sucking the life force out of someone um, mm. to restore themselves. Cause mm. yeah, anyway, um, and then the the sort of the best thing that this film does is give Finn a storyline where he um, give Finn a storyline full stop. Like, <laughs> there yeah, you go, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> a storyline. Um, but a, a storyline which you know is sort of the obvious promise of what the Force Awakens set up, where he um, uh, empowers a bunch of you know uh, inspires a bunch of stormtroopers to throw off their sort of conditioning and shackles and um, and fight the good fight. Um, and there's a cool scene where. Uh, Finn does for a stormtrooper what Poe does for Finn at the start of The Force Awakens nice. where he, you know gives him a name or they, they talk about you know, how getting a name is the first step to sort of yeah, returning yeah. Um, and there's like immediate and- chemistry <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the, the sort of yeah, they send out the message and then there's a huge big sort of, uh, you know, people rising up in the streets type of thing to overthrow the First Order on Coruscant and um, it gets a bit iffy at the end where Ray and Kylo Ren sort of fight, 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 and then uh, at the last minute um, you get a very similar beat to what happened in The Rise of Skywalker where Leia sort of reaches out to, to Ben and Kylo Ren only hearing his mother's name is that's all all it needed to happen to uh, hearing his mother's voice. All name? it needed to happen to, to <laughs> turn him around. Yeah, it's a very sort of, uh, it's just cheap. Um, overall, the film, the, the, the script is... If I was to describe it, 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 there's bits of it that feel really generic and feel kind of obvious. Um, like at one point they do the, uh, we're being, you know, here come the policemen or here come the stormtroopers, kiss me for a distraction kind of beat. Right. Um, there's <laughs> cool. a bunch Between of stuff Poe there. And, Finn, which, and it's like, oh, it's happening! <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a bunch of stuff that just feels really predictable, but, uh, and it feels a bit safe, but overall it, it does feel like a uh, a much more sort of solid vision and, yeah. a, and a better conclusion to the to yeah. that trilogy and it feels more connected to the saga than anything that happened in the rise of skywalker I think, um, um my, my favorite part i've only read one little bit of the script and all that it contains is um the stage direction when hux says like <laughs> yeah. oh g- kill them all and they're like we're outnumbered and then it says the stage direction says hux realizes the tragic truth he lost the star wars 
<laughs> and it's like, <laughs> really? and everyone's like, oh my God, it's the worst script ever. And it's like, no, it's like, it's a stage direction. It's a joke Colin Trevorrow put in there to entertain right. himself. Like, that's right. perfectly yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah. And just, just he, for the actors and the crew, the people that actually read the script. Yeah. 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 And he, and then he goes and kills himself with Mace Windu's lightsaber. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, I didn't like that part. I I do think Hux might be the biggest, like my my, my kind of underground Star Wars opinion is that the treatment of Hux in The Rise of Skywalker might be my least favorite thing about the film because they literally just replace him with another character. Yeah. Whereas I would have loved to have seen Hux be the be the the big yeah. bad guy. Well, the also they trilogy. do something really interesting with him when they go when he's like, "I'm the spy," and you go, "Fuck, he was a spy the whole time," and it's like, "Yeah, I've been a spy since the last movie off screen." That's all. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, then they just run through some of my observations from the script. Yep. And if you guys have any thoughts about them, it's like um, Ray has a double bladed blue lightsaber in this film, which is just like a Very fun, cool. like anyone could have predicted that, but they just never went with that it. That would have been a really good toy. Um, yeah, it would have. <laughs> um, a bearded Kylo Ren, like Adam sure. Driver with a beard and a ragged cloak for the first part of the movie Gotta would have been do pretty something. cool. Um, I've written here, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on pod. Yes. Fucking scenes. <laughs> How long have you been coming on the show? I don't know. Beat me out if you want. Um, I, yeah, I wrote fucking scenes between Kylo and Luke. And in fact, mm. Luke has scenes with all of the characters in the film that he should have scenes with. He yeah. has dialogue Ghost with Leia. Life, of course. He has, you know, sure, but it's the character. Um, mm. He has dialogue with Kylo and he has dialogue with Rey and it's all pretty good because stuff. Because in The Last Jedi, the last thing he says to Kylo is, see you around, kid. <laughs> yeah. And then never sees And so Luke, <laughs> Luke sort of haunts Kylo Ren what in a, a cool way that's idea. fucking, yeah, That's great. the coolest idea from the script, that Luke haunts Kylo Ren. Yeah. Such and, a cool And idea. there's a bit where Luke catches Kylo Ren's lightsaber blade mm. in mid-air and like holds it and mm. it freaks so Kylo cool. out. Yeah. Um, I imagine him like uh, haunting a- Kylo, but it's just like when we see his daily routine in The Last Jedi. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. Kylo gets up in the morning and he's just got a fresh glass of blue titty juice for him. <laughs> And mm, and it, mm. where he's, he's Kylo's brushing his teeth and and Luke's like, oh, you're only going to brush your teeth for thirty seconds, huh? <laughs> he's like, oh god, and does it for a further minute and a half. There's a there's a great line where R two D two calls C three PO elitist. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's it continues the promise set up of the last Jedi of regular people being force users, and mm. it uh, there's a child character who's sort of like broom kid, broom kid, not, not it, broom boy, it? but there's like a there's a, a a reflection of that beat right. being sort of fulfilled by this film. Um, Reverse broom the, boy. The thing I never sort of met, I didn't um, fully articulate about that sequence in the middle where they beam a message out to the outlying systems is that it's clearly a. Um, a, a poetic rhyming on Leia's hologram mm. that sort of set off the whole saga. Um, and that's sort of like a cool way of sort of bringing it full circle. Um, Leia obviously has lots of scenes and lots to do in the film. And she's yeah. an actual character in it. And I guess this gets to the, um, to, to why this film never got made. Um, if, if we can want to speculate, um, Carrie Fisher died and they had to, reassess what they were going to do for episode nine and this this film uh you couldn't just uh cut the layer stuff out really it, it sound, really you work. described all of it without mentioning layer once and uh, it sounded fine yeah it sure but, I mean, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah sure yeah. you'd have to like well i don't know read the script because she's she's in there a bunch mm-hmm. uh, well and she's she has a sort of an exchange with kylo at the end when yeah. they um ex- you know force connect or whatever um but yeah, I mean, I think that's what happened behind the scenes is the the brain team, the brain trust at Lucasfilm went, right, we don't have Carrie Fisher anymore, so we're going to have to do some rewrites to episode nine. And Pretty extensive, in that, though. In that process, Colin Trevorrow got fired, I guess. I thought he got fired because of Booker Henry. Yeah. And also Rose got sidelined, you know, like how they <laughs> came out. They were like, oh, Rose has a small role because we were focusing on the Leia thing. Mm. That doesn't I mean, make any it, fucking I think sense. It, <laughs> It's worth repeating. It's worth um, pointing out that this film was much like the Last Jedi was written as a reaction. Or uh, Ryan Johnson only read the script for the Force Awakens and saw footage. He didn't right. see the completed f- film while he was. Or he maybe did, but um, he didn't get the global reaction to the film. This film was written based on the script for the Last Jedi and not so much the film itself. So you're getting like a a kind of cohesive storytelling that runs through based on what the writers were doing rather than that's, what the filmmaking that's was doing. That's an interesting thing to think about because it's like you would read the last jedi and be like oh yeah cool there's this new female character rose yeah sure people are gonna love her (laughs) Mm. 
or yeah. even if they don't, like she's a major character set up in that film, yeah. so it makes complete sense that you carry her forward into yeah. the next film. Yeah. The the thing I've seen in concept art that that has stuck with me about Jewel of the Fates um, is that during at the end of the Battle of Coruscant, um, uh, R2D2 dies. And there's 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 uh, this concept art of C three PO like cradling yeah. a dead R two D two, and I gotta say, I would have been stunned mm. if that happened. That's such a good idea. Like it, you read, you see, whenever it's posted on Facebook, all the comments on that photo are like, "No." It's like, <laughs> well, fucking, you've got to do this shit. You've got to set these stakes. He, Killing R two D two would have been a jaw dropping moment and mm. and something that really goes hey we're not which is what the reason they didn't do it is, is what i'm about to say mm. it would have been a, a way to go hey we're not just making sequels for sequels sake we're actually continuing a story continuing and wanting and to concluding yeah conclude stuff and to to um add to the legacy of what we talk about when we talk mm. about star wars but they don't they want to keep I mean, the original to trilogy. burst your bubble in that touch. same script r2d2 is repaired by the end of the film bullshit don't repair him <laughs> kill him why not yeah, i mean I, I, I agree with you they should have they should have killed some characters um yeah. but i don't know if you, yeah the film f- concludes with r2d2 uh recounting the events of the film from his uh, the saga from his perspective i don't th- um, i think they should have just killed him that would have been a great end to sure. the character yeah in summary i think jewel of the fates would have been a really fun summer movie it, there's parts of it where i think in reality i think i would have not liked a lot of the execution or a lot of the ways they went with the story but i don't think i would have just roundly hated it the way i, hate I think i would have ranked them the Last Jedi, Jewel of the Fates, Force Awakens. Yeah, I, th- oh. I would. <laughs> but I, what a strange thing to say, based off a movie I haven't seen. I think I would have liked it more than another movie I've seen. <laughs> well, I mean, um, if, to be fair though, you did say you liked The Rise of Skywalker more than Force Awakens. No, well. don't bring that up. <laughs> there was a brief moment of unable. Uh, like that. Here's the truth. <laughs> The Rise of Skywalker was so bad it confused me to the point where I was like, I didn't realize I didn't like it until two other people said they didn't like it and then I was like oh yeah I didn't like it either I'll jump on that bandwagon no it wasn't a bandwagon thing. <laughs> it was like it, it was like it was it was a profound experience to be honest it was uh, and for those who don't know which is almost everyone listening I guess like this we, what we're talking about took place over a three minutes not like a couple of days or anything <laughs> like like the movie ended and I was like I think I, I didn't mind it and then within four people saying something i was like oh my god that was terrible but imagine what would have happened if everyone around you had liked it yeah i would have loved it <laughs> <laughs> yeah because i i turned to you as soon as the credits started and i said is it just me or was that unfathomably bad and you went really i think i liked it more than the force awakens and then i was like fuck maybe i'm the asshole <laughs> and then i wandered over to you richard and you were like you were like real like you didn't you you were really uh, uncertain about how I was going to react, and I just did. I just give you a thumbs down or something, and you were just like, no, you I could said, just... "Richard, I, I was there." Richard <laughs> yeah. was like, "What do you think of it?" And you were like, "I fucking hated every second." <laughs> <laughs> and then I vaguely recall Richard. Just yeah, but like, you were so joyful in your hatred. You were like, "Yeah, bro, yeah. it was fucking terrible." Well, because yeah. nothing's more fun than hating Star Wars. I think no, <laughs> it is not. Yeah. It, was, it was a horrible experience, but I think I hated it from about twenty or thirty minutes, and I was like, "Oh, this isn't just not good. I fucking hate this." For me, it was just immediately denying my hatred whenever something I didn't like happened. Because I was like, no, you've got to enjoy it, AJ. It's Star Wars. Oh, anyway, I've really enjoyed the last few months of slowly taking down posters and removing pieces of stuff. <laughs> so I, I really don't need this right now. We wow. can move on. Um, although, actually, it's, uh, as we were talking about Lost Media, it did occur to me, or, uh, you know, this... I'm, I'm a Star Wars guy. Like Star Wars has a disproportionate relationship to the Lost Media concept compared to other franchises. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like the holiday special is a piece of Lost Media. Arguably, the original cut of Star Wars yeah. is now a piece of Lost Media. George yeah. Lucas claims that when they did the special edition, they damaged the negative in a way where we cannot get that film anymore, which I call bullshit. Mm. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, there's like the prequels are Lost Media. <laughs> the Rise of Skywalker is Lost Media. Yeah, Lost to me. <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch um, of my games fandom for well, Star Wars. Like- is lost media yeah there's, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of games there's like star wars 13 13 yeah, yeah, right. there's yeah. a darth maul game there's a battlefront 3 that got like halfway yeah. through production or something um and speaking <laughs> of video games if we can mm. move along now to a piece of i guess lost media that i'm real fascinated by um it maybe is a bit more niche than justice league or star wars um but when you look up crash bandicoot right 
you look up Crash Bandicoot games that never happened. There's a plethora of different of various different games that never got off production, uh, got out of production. But the one that I am most intrigued by was a 2009 game uh, that was cancelled midway through production. It's made for PS3, uh, Wii, Xbox 360, and Nintendo DS. It has a couple of working titles. Uh, the most popular one used was Crash Landed. Um, another title you'll see around is I Am Crash Bandicoot. Um, <laughs> my favorite one that I've seen only in only a few places, um, it was apparently briefly titled Crash of the Bandicoots, which I really like. Oh, nice. Um, so the development of the game started in 2009, uh, but was cancelled when Activision decided to lay off the entire development team behind the game, which Jesus. is a very Activision kind of move, if you have even a, a vague knowledge of the gaming industry. Um, so the, the plot was, after being mutated by Cortex, Crash would have gotten entangled with a task of rescuing fellow bandicoots that weren't mutated, and some, they were sometimes called bandicoots or bandicoots depending on what you read. Uh, so unlike Crash, they weren't uh, evolved by scientific corporate con- contraptions, so they were mostly defenseless little critters. So they actually looked like what a bandicoot, Bro. like a cartoon version of what a bandicoot actually looks like. So I think uh, I can tell why you like this so much. Why? Because it's just Crash Bandicoot. Odd world, isn't it? Yeah, it's very similar to Oddworld, actually. Yeah, you're saving people. Um, and it's it was kind of like a reboot of the series because it kind of takes place instead of the first Crash Bandicoot as well. Um, in concept art, the Bandy Keats or Bandy Cutes are trapped in dangerous areas until Crash freed them. Dingo Dial would have been a major villain in the game and part of an unfinished cutscene that shows him firing a bunch of Bandicoots out of a cannon. Uh, despite footage of a prototype level for the Nintendo DS version of the game being leaked to the internet, which you can find, no finished gameplay footage of the game has been released or leaked to the internet. There are a few screenshots, though, and some concept art showing an open-world version of the classic Crash Bandicoot Island environments with Crash and the other characters taking on a distinctly more cell shaded cartoonish style. It's a very nice-looking style, I think. Um, one of the main innovations of the game was an invention system. Uh, by finding and combining them to, things together, you'll be able to craft some rudimentary yet imaginative, I just copied this from the wiki, <laughs> effective tools. So you could stick a frog inside a pl- inside a plastic bottle and make a frog zooka. Um, you could use uh, catap- make catapults and jetpacks out of like soda bottles. Um, oh, no, sorry, you filled them with fireflies and make a make a make a jetpack. Um, mm and uh the crash was going to have an upgradable health bar and judging by some screenshots this was coupled with the humorous detail of crash losing his pants after taking too much damage so when you're on like your last health point you're just running around in underwear um and here's something I'd, I'd looked up this game before and i didn't know this part the game was going to be accompanied by a directly related spin-off called crash team racing uh, mm-hmm. Not to be confused with the original 1999 Crash Team Racing. Um, it would, so it would have been a racing spinoff, uh, which looks... There's a trailer for it online. There's like a prototype released of it. It looks fucking awesome. So you, the, the, uh, they only made four characters, which was Crash, Dingo Dial, Polar, and a new character called Land Shark, who would have debuted and Crash Landed. Um, and the carts would have been fully customizable uh, with tires and bumpers and engines. Um, so you could alter the carts so that they can do different things on the same track. So on one level, there'd be like a a vertical wall you can only drive up if you've got suction cup tires on. So right. each track would have mul- like replay value essentially because you could finish it in different ways. Um, and another addition was uh, special moves unique to each of the characters. So Crash could spin uh, and Dingo Dial could use his flamethrower. Um, it's a cool looking looking pair of games. Tell you what, you guys should should look into it. Are you are you much into Crash Bandicoot, Rowan? I don't have a PlayStation. Mm. <laughs> this has been a very alienating segment of of this episode for you, then. Rather, it's interesting though. Mm. We did have to talk about more than just just uh, movies, though. I think Fair if enough, we're doing yeah, a yeah. media, episode. I've got a, I've got a different spin to throw on Lost Media sweet, for the end sweet. as well. Um, so, Richard, as a fellow Crash Bandicoot fan, what do you think of that game? Uh, I actually don't think it sounds very good. I um, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, because this is this is coming after Mind Over Mutant and Crash of the mm. Titans. And yeah, I just I just think it would have been maybe a fine game, but you'd be like, why is this Crash Bandicoot? Right. That's what I'm picturing. I did just as you were talking, um, looked up the the gameplay footage of the the cart racer, and um, that looks quite fun. Yeah, 
Yeah. 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 So there you go. That's that's my um when we assigned uh, roles for this podcast episode, we were like, do a big one and a little one. And my little one was a lot bigger than my big one because I did not want to talk about Justice League for as long as if we did. Um, but yeah, okay. Well, Rowan, you just briefly teased that. You oh, no, we should span. save that to the very end. We've got okay. any other movies and things to talk about. All right. Well, Richard, do you have another piece of lost media you'd like to uh, discuss? Yeah, I do, I do just want to briefly give a shout out to, um, speaking of video games, uh, there's a game called Wild that um, the trailer was released in 2014. And I learned a new word this week, Vapor wear which is um Hmm. it sounds like malicious but it's essentially for when something is a a, a, it's essentially the lost media version of video games or like software Hmm. um for it's just vapor it doesn't exist right um but the the sort of conceit of it was made by the guy who made rayman and the whole kind of idea was that it's set like millions of years ago and you can control like any animal (laughs) So you can like oh, fly around yes. as a bird and then like become an elephant and then, yeah. Could you also control, the, what game is it where you can play as everything? Is it the same one? I think it's probably that, but it never came out. And it's probably and never you can will. play as like flowers and bugs and atoms. Pro- yeah, I think that's probably it, yeah. And then also universes and stuff, yeah. Maybe, maybe not. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, so this was announced and, and has a gameplay trailer in 2014. And every now and then I go, it must be out now and I'll look it up. But now it's like, yeah, it's considered vaporware. Oh, wow. That's so, a shame. Yeah. Um, okay, so my my little one, there, and also you know keeping this podcast timely, um, there was a, an article written in the last week or two about um, the original writer of the film yesterday, and so this is yeah. similar to Jewel of mm. the Fates that it's like lost, quote unquote, lost media. I mean, we don't have a script, but it's like it's just a version of a film that was never produced. Um, so yesterday being the movie that came out last year about yeah. the the guy who after some kind of unexplainable global event he's the only one who can remember the Beatles. Um, and then uh yeah he he writes he you know passes the songs off as as his own um struggles for a couple of days and then gets a phone call from ed sheeran who goes do you want to be famous and he goes yep and then he is an overnight success biggest star in the world so um this guy jack bath um that's b-a-r-t-h is the original writer of the script. So he he was 62 when he sold his first feature script for, for yesterday. Um, his version was called Cover Version. And it was acquired by Working Title, uh, which is the studio, and then eventually became Yesterday. Um, and Richard Curtis was like, it, it seems like as soon as he got the script, he was like, yep, you're getting a story by credit. I'm going to make it my own kind of thing. Um, and... Because, you know, he just liked the idea. And so Jack Bath was like, went to Hollywood and was like, hey, I, I'm, I'm a writer. I sold my first script at 62. Like, that's a pretty cool story, don't you think? And they go, nah, well, we really like the story that Richard Curtis and Danny Boyle are working together for the first time. So we're kind of going to hide the fact that you had anything to do with this. Um, also, it's interesting, uh, worth mentioning that Jack Bath, um, he wrote the episode of The Simpsons, A Fish Called Salma which is one where Troy and uh, Troy McClure and Selma get married. Although he um, clarified that the Planet of the, Ape- Planet of the Apes musical uh, was not his idea. <laughs> so like, the best part of the episode. <laughs> um, but so the, the most interesting thing I think that came out of the story is his original um, thing is, so he came up with the idea for cover version uh, when he was lying in bed one night and thought, fuck, if I came up with Star Wars now, I wouldn't be able to get it made. I just don't, yeah. I don't have the connections um and it's it's not like the like if i was the if i was the first person to came up come up with it i wouldn't be able to do it um and so his it seems like it was a quite a a sobering tale like that a lot of Mm. creatives can relate to that it's about all about the message versus the messenger and that in cover version he doesn't become an overnight success he Mm. he's stuck really and and that, that brief moment in yesterday um is essentially sounds like it's the entire film um where you realize that i know i'm sitting on gold and people don't care because i'm nobody um which is yeah i think a lot of people struggle with that and that, that's kind of jack bath's um mm-hmm. life you know he's, he it took him to age 62 to sell his first script but richard curtis came straight out of college was mates with ron atkinson who hit it big and he was like sweet yeah i'll let, let me ride your coattails and so to him to richard curtis um, if you have a good idea, yeah, you will in- inevitably end up rich and famous because yeah, yeah. that's how his life worked out. And he, he 
you know, presumably just thinks that everyone out there who isn't famous just hasn't had their good idea yet. And so, uh, yeah, that's the most interesting thing I, I sort of got out of this is that What's like- What's so yeah, relatable, the the yeah, bath version. Yeah, is totally. Like, we're, we're, we're a podcast that's gone for five years and we're the best podcast in the world and we still have under 500 plays per episode. <laughs> um, but Brutal. so... I, I, to be, I have to yeah. be honest with you guys, I actually come from an alternate universe where Cole Popcher <laughs> is the biggest <laughs> podcast in the world. And so I came, I decided to invent you know it myself it's hurt. and it's nowhere after all this stuff. Ring, ring, <laughs> ring, ring. Hello, it's um, the guy Mark from... Maron. Um, it's Ira Glass here. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so th- there is like a lot of, because, so Richard Curtis claimed that um, he just just got told the idea and then wrote the script himself. But there is like a lot of similarities between it. Um, like the uh, character's name is the same and there's like, there's a lot of similar story beats and it's like, there is the love story, but it's not as big a part of cover version. And they both end on a joke about not remembering Harry Potter, which weirdly Richard Curtis, uh, Richard Curtis credits to Sarah Silverman. He's like, yeah, yeah. Sarah Silverman. I met her at a party and told her the idea. And she said, Oh, it should end on Harry Potter on a Harry Potter joke, which is in Bath's original script. So it's maybe this is i mean i I, i'm definitely on bath's side here so i don't want to give richard curtis any leeway here but it's not an incredibly hard ending yeah it might might just be a joke you come to thinking about that material for long yeah yeah yeah, for sure because in yesterday like coca-cola doesn't exist either and and lots of things don't exist Yeah, yeah um but yeah i mean that was the most interesting part of the film yesterday the 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 idea that it's not the material it's me like he yeah. can't get success and, and then yeah and that's that's one of the things i hated about yesterday was that i was like you the if the beatles didn't exist first of all you wouldn't fucking have ed, ed sheeran like and and you, if yeah, you made those yeah, beatles yeah. songs no one's gonna hear them it's 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 what is and it sounds like my my grievances was exactly the kind of film that that jack bath had, had yeah written. And, and also like the fact that in yesterday it's not like um he had it big on soundcloud or anything like that like how people actually become famous yeah, when yeah. it's like they are just really talented but they don't have the platform it's just ed sheeran happens to be watching like public access television hmm. in a small town at like 11 30 at night yeah. and hears the song and like that like that's the ridiculous part of it. it was like oh he's creating some buzz online you know yeah yeah um but then the, the yeah. not ridiculous part of that is it takes a huge hand up from an established success story to for the the main character to get his yeah. break like mm. yeah yeah mm. and also i also didn't like and richard curtis has done this twice now that i can think of as he does and i'm sure we've talked about this on the podcast before like he's got two films about time and yesterday although i don't even want to call yesterday his now um where it's <laughs> like there's there's like really intriguing sci-fi concept mixed with a love story and in both films he clearly cares more about the love story than the rules of his own universe and i don't know i'm it's I was not just, a black mirror episode yeah I, but, but I, don't, I can i can have a love story in there as well but i don't that should be secondary to the much more interesting like i can watch a love story anytime well yeah i think that's the thing is like um like about time is like oh it's a love story but it has time travel and it ends up actually being like you know a father-son story and i i really like that about it but um it's just the whole like everyone's wondered if i could go back in time and like claim whatever piece of media as my own and write it um you know well like would i be able to to get it and so yesterday is and and this is what um jack bath said and and they said that's kind of the most upsetting thing about it is that um it's actually you know cost him a lot of money and and, and all the stuff because it's now he can't tell people he made yesterday because they go no you fucking didn't you richard curtis did but he said Mm -hmm. the one thing that yesterday he said people um you know the, the the film got kind of mixed reviews but everyone thinks it's a great idea and mm. that's that was what was his and then mm, richard yeah. curtis ruined it and gave it mixed reviews um yeah. and so now it's like yeah talking about so time travel doesn't feel like it's a wasted concept concept on um on about time because it's like yeah there's there's trillions of no they're not trillions mm. it's stupid there's hundreds <laughs> thousands of time travel movies um but <laughs> 
like yesterday feels like such a unique singular concept that it it does feel wasted on this like Mm, i would love to see cover version or like any other but like it feels like the beatles is the only artist you could do it with really yeah um but yeah i mean the, the whole go back in time or alternate universe where you know you came up with the idea first it's the sports almanac fantasy yeah Mm. yeah uh, and, then, and then the final film so aggressively feels like a richard curtis movie as well because yeah. the, the love story is so central to yeah. all of their concerns by the midpoint of the film god it's so disappointing it's mm. so disappointing because it takes what would be a universal when you just feeling. had the idea where, sorry not your when you guys were talking about it in your most anticipated and all you knew was the nugget of the idea you were calling it like your most anticipated film i of thought it'd be great yeah. i yeah. love danny boyle mm. I'm okay yeah. on Richard Curtis, but like <laughs> yeah, I yeah. thought it'd be awesome, and mm. it ended up being, I don't, know, I didn't hate it, but Just it was like, com. yeah, that, that's the thing, like wrong pe- in all the wrong ways. People ask me what I thought of yesterday. I gave it five stars. I I fucking loved it. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, but like I I was really like if I rewatched it again, I'd probably the flaws of it would probably you know mm. get, get at me a little bit more but It'd be a yeah i was just AJ really in the mood for a skywalker situation wouldn't it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like yeah i was just it was exactly what i was in the mood for and um yeah i just had a yeah. great time with it and you know yeah, we, sometimes we some, we like and i think that that's richard curtis's curtis films that they're just like if you're in the right mood and you want to like have a nice love story you'll yeah you'll he makes feel it. good rom-coms yeah mm. and i felt good yeah, he was nice. like, dude, I think I like that more than The Force Awakens. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Rowan, what is your final one for the episode? What is your lost media? I have just two, media? There's two pieces. This isn't the, the tease I had before. Um, so there's two pieces of lost media that, like, I, you know, it's just like on point to kind of talk about. And that I reckon is um, all the footage of Eric Schultz playing Marty McFly in Back to the Future <laughs> yeah. and uh, Stuart Townsend playing Aragorn in Lord of the Rings. Like, mm-hmm. Those are examples of lost media that we just like, it's so tantalizing because it exists somewhere. <laughs> and wouldn't mm. you just love to see like, it's kind of what we're going to get out of justice league is yeah, like yeah. alternate versions of the same movie, just with a completely different spin on yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what I, what, what I was teasing before is we could maybe roll this into a little PSA. Have you guys ever lost media? Like we've all made stuff. All oh, right. Have you had that hard, like that, you know, that just guttural crushing experience of losing media? Is this um, something you genuinely want to talk about, or was this you oh, going? We can talk about it, briefly. man. I can't think of a th- of a second option, <laughs> so I'm gonna. No, nah, it just occurred to me before. Oh, like, nice. No, no, know. fair enough. I've lost. I've had a hard drive stolen, and I've had a hard drive corrupt, and stuff that I made mm. was on there, and it's just gone. I have stuff I deeply, deeply never want to see again <laughs> um, get deleted off YouTube. When I, th- I'm only saying this because you asked me, but the the when I was 13, me and my friends made like a a very uh, bad version of like Jackass, like us oh. doing like trying to do some <laughs> stuff. And I remember um, I uploaded them to YouTube, and because there was licensed music in it, um, they stripped the audio out of it yeah. and i didn't i no longer had the original versions on my computer mm. and so and i couldn't get it back because the audio had been stripped out of it and that was that's the most relate i can relate to your sentiment there is that <laughs> i had i had a yeah i had a had a video that was that i lost forever because youtube took the sound out of it because it had Damn uh, animals I, by nickelback in you're it. in a good <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i have a couple of things i made at broadcasting school that i'm like quite proud of that i I probably could find potentially or if i like spoke to people i haven't spoken to in years um i could like maybe find copies of it but i know i know where they are on the desktop of my macbook that won't that hasn't turned on for like six years <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay well back up your media folks yeah <laughs> one, two is one and one is none wow Wow. What backup services do you guys use? Google Drive. Yeah, Google Drive. Oh, okay. I yeah. mean more like yeah, whatever. Okay. Um actually as of two days ago, some lost media that we that Cole Popcher has now is the behind the scenes footage of Winger and Troop our Star Wars web series that we started and never finished and in 2017 i deleted that off the hard drive off the google drive because it was taking up too much space oh, and i was like no. I'm, I'm never going to edit this oh well i'll just be the one to to shout out to the piece of pop culture 
cult pop show lost media that I want to see, mm. which is the episode that you guys will apparently never release unless what? unless someone no. puts forward a truck ton of money. A thousand dollars on Patreon, Richard <laughs> will give you access to it. We have enough patrons where now we you guys can all just. I think what you need is just rally just together a, a teaser, like like insert fraction of a second of that episode here. No, it's the <laughs> it's the day the clown cried of Cop Pop. Like that actually, oh, I then, hear it so it's badly. funny though. There is actually a lost piece of media about that that because we, we did another podcast oh, yeah. uh, called "Why Did I Do That" with our friend um, Charlie, who we had on Spy Kids um, film franchise Fortnites, and so we went on and we recorded like a two hour podcast <laughs> talking about. Um, our experience, because because the the whole idea of uh, why did I do that and go check it out is that like uh, you you they, he gets guests on and they come and tell like embarrassing stories, essentially things that you've done that make you think why did I do that, and um, we went on and told the entire story and got like really personal <laughs> and like all of our like yeah. where our relationship was at at the time, um, and then we <laughs> so we sent the files to him via WeTransfer. Um, and you know it takes uh, after seven days it deletes them and it got to like six and a half days and we messaged charlie and we're like dude download our files <laughs> and then he was like, oh yeah and he did and then it got to like quite a while later and it still hadn't been released and then he messaged us and was like hey guys so i accidentally um lost um your your files do you guys still have them and neither of us did <laughs> And um, so now, and then he just ended up releasing an episode saying, I lost the episode about Cult Pops' lost episode. Oh. Man, it makes you wonder how much lost media is, is like, we transfer is responsible for, or <laughs> Drive is responsible, or Snapchat is responsible for, you know? Oh, like, so think, many, like, <laughs> I think of all the drawings I forget to save on Draw Something, and I'm like, that's lost media. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, cool. Well, if that's that's all we've got, um, I hope you guys have enjoyed listening to our rundown of some of our favourite, almost interesting pieces of lost media to, um, you know, tangentially coincide with the news <laughs> of the Snyder Cut. To, um, uh, you know... <laughs> <laughs> so what, how, how we come up with our off weeks a lot of the time is like right what's a big news story okay this um how can we compartmentalize this with other examples let's do that <laughs> so this is one of those episodes but i enjoyed it i enjoyed talking about this and it was, a lot yeah. of it was very interesting so um maybe we can spin off this idea into you know maybe we can do an episode on um on something other than star wars yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah other pieces of lost media or literally actually what is classed as lost media or unmade sequels like maybe I we can do unmade an sequels on. would be a fun one let's do unmade sequels yeah um or like maybe uh you know after this podcast comes out and uh, and gets like a lukewarm reception uh <laughs> then give me the chance to edit it and and release the richard cut of this <laughs> podcast <laughs> let's do it well if you want to hear that cut then please make sure that you're subscribed to cult pop on all our channels um i need a i'm gonna write see my computer there rowan i'm mm. gonna write down the outro on that computer and whiteboard marker <laughs> so, so that I can just read it nice, from now on. Nice. Um, but yeah, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. We're all at Cop Pop Show. There's, there's also the Cop Pop Show podcast YouTube channel, which is what you might be listening to this one on. Um, and you can also email us at media at gmail.com. You can join our Discord and chat with us every fucking day we talk on that Discord. So come and join and us. And every fun. fucking night. And, the, and at the moment, we currently have 69 members. Ooh. So come and ruin that for us. Come and ruin that milestone for us. <laughs> um, and yeah, and we also have a Patreon if you want to support the show. Patreon.com slash Speaking of which, let's transition now into our post credit scene. Fuck Star Wars. For this episode. Same Fuck list. Star Wars. Fuck Star Wars. Fuck Star Wars. Amen. Okay, welcome to our post credit sequence. This is part of the show brought to you by our patrons over at patreon.com slash Popshire, where if you donate $5 or more a month, such a small amount of money, you too can give us a little discussion prompt to talk about for this post credit sequence. Richard, how are you? Sorry, did you mean me? Yeah, sorry. How are you? Good. Sometimes like, when- so it, what, so what happened there was I was doing a bit pretending not to answer but i could see in the reflection of your glasses that you had clicked away from me <laughs> and so you had a moment where 
you panicked and thought that I like didn't hear you or I misunderstood the question. Mm. Um, and so it created a fun little um, misunderstanding. Imagine if I, could you tell if I was just looking at porn right now? Uh, we'll try it. All right. Uh, porn images. Ah, God. <laughs> you never think it's going to yeah. be like actual porn for some, for some reason i thought if you google porn into google images there's some kind of safeguard that's not going to show you actual porn but did, did it actually come with actual porn for you yeah there was like oh okay yeah no, there's actual porn there was actual um, boners and stuff <laughs> it depends on you know if you've got safe search on mm, i don't i never do dangerous yeah fuck you yeah. uh, uh, anyway <laughs> yeah so this is our post credit scene um you can give us this if you donate uh more than five five dollars or more at patreon.com slash cold pop um and today's post credit scene comes to us from kate pickwith another one from kate pickwith who says what are some of the best adult jokes hidden in kids movies bonus if you missed it as a child um what's an example of an adult's joke in a kids movie I feel like the, this is such a cliched answer, but fuck Road to El Dorado is a filthy movie for a kid's movie. Yeah. Have you seen that movie? Uh, not since I was a kid. Yeah, that's filthy, dude. There's like literally like... A, I know I know the... I remember the blowjob There's scene. a blowjob scene in it. It's a kid's movie. And even... I remember... I watched that movie so much as a kid. And even as a kid, I remember seeing that and being like, something's going on here. Like, this is very mm-hmm. graphic for a kid's movie. Um, if you haven't seen it, look up El Dorado Blowjob. Look up that. I feel like that's, that's probably the craziest thing I've seen in a in a kid's movie. Um, but I'm sure there are other examples. There's that scene, I, we must have talked about this before, but there's that bit in Shrek where Lord Farquaad is watching um, Princess Fiona on the magic mirror over and over again. And people say, yeah. you see him get a boner. But it's just, the, for me, it's just this real uncanny valley um, sequence where it kind of feels like the camera's staying on him for a bit too long because he kind of like looks mm. down at his crotch and then like pulls his sheet up and and looks real nervous. And it, it feels more like a joke that doesn't land than anything else. But, you know, 20 people would have animated that scene. So <laughs> someone yeah. knew what was going on. Um, also, I think just the law, the fact that his name's Fuckwad. Yeah. That's one. I th- Do you know what? I think I got that when I was a kid, though. Yeah, like that's the thing. It's like, and, and like, the, do you think he's compensating for something? Like all these, like I feel like I got them. Well, I didn't necessarily get that because I didn't know what the word compensating was when I was seven or eight. But I remember, I remember hearing he was Lord Farquaad, and thinking, oh, because because of fuckwad, which was a you know common expression in the playground when I was <laughs> in, in two thousand one. Um, but it, that that then makes me think it can't be fuckwad. Because it's too obviously fuckwad that how did that make it past the only way Farquad makes it past like the the board of senses or whatever is by them explaining it's actually means something else. I've always mm. I've always assumed that, and I think I've read it somewhere as well. What does Farquad mean? <laughs> oh, it's just bonus. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the name of the character closely resembles Fuckwad. All right. Yeah. Oh, there you go. All right. Better <laughs> living, everyone. 